Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we are uh, incredibly happy that uh, Vera Karuskeli is with us tonight to talk about uh, Kurdish lobbying opportunities. Uh, before I introduce uh, Vera, I just want to say a few words about the, the Center for Kurdish Progress. Uh, as, as we all know, it's the voice of the British Kurdish community and uh, in the UK, and it's the first platform for those uh, seeking to understand the Kurdish community's interests and concerns. Uh, it's an independent and nonpartisan organization, and it provides a platform uh, for discussing issues affecting the British Kurdish community in the United Kingdom and the Kurdish speaking communities across the Middle East. And uh, we know that they organize uh, numerous meetings throughout the year with policymakers, with academics, and uh, with politicians. So uh, we are very grateful for the events that they're organizing. And uh, this evening, we are hosting Mary Karuskeli. Uh, she's a professor of political science and international relations at Siena uh, College in Albany, New York, uh, where she also contributes as the academic community engagement scholar in residence uh, by creating collaborations with immigrant and refugee organizations. Uh, her research focuses on Kurdish diaspora mobilization, lobbying, and cultural expressions of ethno-nationalism. Among her more recent publications are uh, Kurdish lobbying and political activism in the US, in a collection she co-edited on Kurdish autonomy and the US foreign policy, published by Peter Lang in 2020, and a contribution titled Do I Even Exist? Kurdish diaspora artists reflect on imaginary exhibits in a Kur Kurdistan museum uh, in the Art of Minorities, published by Edinburgh Press in 2020. Ikarius Kelly serves as an expert witness for asylum cases in New York Immigration Court, and she's also a regular political contributor uh, on WAMC Radio, a regional affiliate of uh, National Public Radio. Um, and uh, my name is Bahar Bashar. I'll be moderating the, this event tonight. Uh, I am also uh, an associate professor at Coventry University in the UK. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, say a few words uh, about Vera, uh, personal uh, anecdotes. Uh, so uh, I have been working on um, diaspora mobilization in Europe for a long time. And I also focused on the Kurdish case uh, in my PhD thesis and beyond. And uh, Vera inspired me. Uh, when I started my PhD, and she has always been a great uh, mentor. Uh, and uh, she inspired many other young scholars uh, because her work actually pioneered uh, the, the scholarly work on Kurdish uh, lobbying and activism, especially in Europe within the uh, German context. And uh, she is a great feminist. Uh, she supports uh, female scholars and uh, also uh, early career scholars. And she doesn't just uh, talk, but she actually walks the talk. So I, I'm, I feel really honored that I'm actually uh, moderating a talk given by one of my role models. So welcome, Vera. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And the floor is yours. And if you have questions, please use the chat box. And uh, at the end of Vera's talk, uh, I will uh, pose her the questions that are in the chat, chat box. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bahar. It's wonderful to be here today and I can't thank you enough because um, I always think of you as a very special friend and supporter and um, it is lovely to spend this time with you uh, to have received this invitation by um, the Center for Kurdish Progress and to see all of you here. What I'm envisioning is that um, I will talk for a little while maybe 15-20 minutes about some key themes. And I have um, six or seven slides to show you to give a little bit of background of how to think through some of these issues. And then I think it would be really important to have a conversation and a discussion about what's going on, because I think some of you, of course, I know, I know that some of you are academics, others are activists. And um, I find it essential to really engage in this conversation because uh, we have not, we don't put enough thought into systematic thinking through lobbying and international advocacy issues. So I'm going to try and share my screen so you can um, see um, the slides. And I'm hoping that um, let me see i'm going to move this around a little bit and then show you the slideshow from the beginning all right i think we're good to go is that correct excellent 
So I put on the bottom here my email because I find it exceptionally important for anybody who wants to get a hold of me to send me an email afterwards. I'm very interested in connecting with all of you, um, sharing ideas because nothing works without networking and sharing, um, especially in lobbying and activism. So this is what my talk is about. Um, five themes I will address. First of all, thinking through the differences between what lobbying is and what activism is. While there is some overlap, they're not the same. And often their issues confused and that leads to deep frustrations. Secondly, I want to look at systemic barriers within especially explaining the US system. Many of you are familiar with the European structure, but the US system has very unique lobbying challenges and I think we need to understand those challenges to be more effective. Then I look at activism, transnational activism and how shifting public opinion works. And then I'll move into opportunities and activism and official lobbying. And then I'm gonna contrast, contrast a little bit what the North American and European context look like. And I am interested in talking beyond the United States and looking at Canada, the United States, and actually Latin America a bit, because I think there are uh, opportunities that are not always considered. So here's kind of a bigger chart. What I want to do with that is lay out on one side the top-down formal lobbying that we see, and on the other side, the bottom-up grassroots activism. Often it is confused and merged into one. I think we need to be more sophisticated. I, I say we because <laughs> I just disclosed I'm not a uh, neutral person, <laughs> but I think we need, we need to be more uh, conscious, aware, and connected to what the differences are to be effective. On the top-down formal lobbying side, what we have to remember is that this is often an official state or sub-state sponsorship or particular ministries sponsor those activities or more recently uh, what we might call philanthrocapitalists or super wealthy individuals who have a particular stake. And we can talk about some of those examples. But here, of course, the official state of sub-state sub sponsor is often in the context of Kurdish discussions, the uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq. The KRG is an official sponsor as a sub-state uh, sponsor of official lobbying. On the other side, lobbying, diaspora, immigrant communities, activists, so that's community-based, that's, that's networks, that's regular people that are interested in advancing agenda. It is important to think about Kur uh, Kurdish lobbying as a high stakes game versus bottom up grassroots is more low stakes or lower stakes. What I mean by that is not more value or lesser value. What I mean by that is official lobbying targets a particular policy, puts all its efforts into mobilizing political support. And so what you see is fluctuations great successes and great faults. So that's the high stakes. You don't succeed, there's little left. So it's a deep, it can be deeply frustrating to people who watch this kind of investment. Lower stakes on the grassroots activism where in essence you work towards long-term long change. You don't have these epic uh, highs and faults. What you do is you consistently pursue improvements and while you have moments of disappointment, there are not often, sometimes of course there are moments of deep horror, but they're often not as linked to particular policies. In lobbying, we have to remember that you outsource your, your agenda, outsourcing to political consultants, to lawyers, to consultants and communications firms. We call that in the United States, the revolving door. What one has to do involved in lobbying is to keep track of what people's careers look like in particular arenas, in, in the political field, as politicians, as advisors, as consultants. They go in and out of politics with different administrations. The revolving door means former administrators, 
go into lobbying and then return back to politics. It's very important to know who supports whom for how long and when. You don't keep track of that, you can get the wrong person entangled in your efforts. On the grassroots side, what we do is insider knowledge and participation. We systemically rely on local allies and friends. We know each other. We try to ex expand those networks. So much more individually oriented and personal connection um, in terms of the efforts. Finally, lobbying is about money. You have to invest a lot of money, significant financial amounts. There are also legal disclosures that are required on official lobbying. And here in the United States, we have the FARA Act, the Foreign Agent Registration Act, which um, we can talk about how much money is spent, where and how, and issues with the FARA Act. But as you might have noticed, the uh, Trump administration was loosey-goosey. Uh, that's not a technical term. They had Michael Flynn, obviously, as one of the early uh, you know, um, foreign policy advisors nominated, who was on the payroll of Turkey. So that's a huge issue, right? The Biden administration is trying to clear those issues up. When we look at bottom-up grassroots activism, we're not talking about enormous financial investments. What we do is we use the talents and the time of dedicated activists. So those are the differences we should consider. I'm going to move on to lessons. Did we learn any lessons from Kurdish lobbying in the US? I mean, OK, uh, it's been a struggle and it's been deeply disappointing, clearly under the Trump administration. But to be honest, I'm not surprised at all um, for a number of reasons. The responsiveness to Kurdish agendas remains minimal in this country. Uh, it, is, it is only of interest when particular individuals or particular parties uh, share that agenda. Um, I can tell you stories of local politicians, in now important politicians, leaders, national leaders, who tell you one thing in private and then say something else publicly. Caution when it comes to political figures. Um, also, I have to say, in general, I would like to critique the lobby efforts that are primarily focused on military interests and fossil fuels. Remember that those rarely translate to other agendas. So if you'd like to layer in human rights, feminism, uh, social justice related issues, environmentalism, uh, military interests and fossil fuels isn't gonna get you there. So often totally different agendas. And then a fair warning. In the United States, public hostility to ethnic lobbying is intense. Ethnic lobbying is what is called generally in the field of political science, um, lobbying by ethnic minorities. Ethnic lobbying under the Trump administration in particular has been called increasingly the foreign lobby to establish linkages between communities here in the United States that are residents or citizens that have a, you know, a, a de dedication to social justice, human rights, and other issues in the homeland region. Um, foreign lobby, that is what is what it's called when you push back, for example, against um, you know, the Saudi lobby, right? Those are the kinds of questions, powerful players, that have a direct interest in influencing US foreign policy. So there is suspicion about ethnic lobbies, I call them, because I think um, we have a lot of history of ethnic lobbies actually being embraced all throughout the Cold War and in the 90s. So let me move on. Formal lobbying efforts. OK, so what happens? What makes a, 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 you know, a formal lobbying effort successful? And what do we have to watch out for? This is part of the essential problems. These are the problems that we see with any kind of formal lobbying. The Kurdish lobby is not united. It is not large. It has diverse uh, ideological positionings. And the more horizontal your approach, the more successful you tend to be because you integrate um, diaspora communities. Clarity in resonance is important. However, if you have 
serious divisions and any sort of you know political science literature on lobbying if it's domestic or international issues economic or you know corporate or uh, ethnic lobbies it'll tell you the same story clarity and resonance matter the more diversity you have within and disagreement the harder it becomes financial resources you have to spend a lot of money on highly skilled and experienced personnel because you hire people that are in very powerful law firms and, and uh, you know, um, communication and, and management firms. It's a lot of money that goes there. So um, mostly, uh, I have to say the Kurdistan region of Iraq or the KRG underspends, but then it's not a surprise. Should they be spending money on this is perhaps the question. So two things they will make, they will give you uh, the best chance to decide whether it's worth it or not. If in the United States, there is no overlap already, no interest that exists already on the issue of trying to lobby, you have no chance of succeeding. If you think a lobby on its own can shift US foreign policy interests, you are lying to yourself. It's a huge apparatus. So if you don't have access to the State Department, to the Pentagon, to congressional and White House staffers that are interested in your agenda, your agenda goes nowhere. There is absolutely no way that an outsider comes in and makes the United States turn around and go a different direction. There has to be overlap. So that overlap has to be discussed, identified, and then enhanced. Furthermore, the Kurdish lobby has enormously powerful enemies. Those other lobbies, i.e. Turkey has an incredibly powerful lobby. Some of you might know that somehow, mm, we can discuss this later, the Turkish government got a hold of somebody at the New York Times and they published the most appalling article about the situation in Rojava and the, the conditions of, you know, uh, that Turkey supposedly has enhanced the lives of resettled Arab communities, totally ignoring the violence and the brutality that the Turkish government committed against Kurdish communities. That was something the Turkish lobby was behind. There's no doubt about it. All right, next one. Uh, internet, transnational issues matter. Transnational diaspora, um, activ activism really makes a difference. So if you want to move from lobbying and weave in activism, many of you online here know that all the things you've been involved in. I was actually so surprised that activism on social media has grown. I think it has worked very well. I'm deeply impressed by the transnationalism, by the connectedness, by the awareness raising video campaigns. I want to do a shout out to the um, Kurdish community in Toronto, perhaps one of the most active uh, communities in, in the, at the moment in the Americas. Incredible efforts, super smart uh, videos, talks, gatherings. The Toronto Kurdish community is only about 7,000 people strong, but their presence is powerful. And I think Janet uh, Beal is on here doing incredible work with her own artistic skills. So Janet, shout out to you. You've done incredible work when it comes to human rights and women's rights and awareness raising. Um, so those are two examples of where, where the activism has um, gained traction online, which I think is fabulous. Now, among the things that we also, I also want to highlight is media outlets are super important. And I wanted to do another mention of a lawsuit, and that might be particularly American in the context that uh, here we have civil action in the, in the US District Court in Colombia. You might remember a few years ago, Erdogan was invited to visit uh, Washington DC, and he, let his bodyguards loose on some protesters, um, basically legal protesters who were standing in the public square 
not far from the uh, Turkish mission office house and um, bodyguards attacked violently the protesters, right? Beat them down, kicked them, several ended up in the hospital. Well, Kasim Kurt is a businessman here in town in Albany um, who decided to spend some serious money on this lawsuit. What's interesting is that within the US context, these lawsuits might bring an eventual outcome. Um, he hired a law firm that has experience with filing such lawsuits for indigenous people in Latin America on oil spills. So when indigenous people complain about corporate uh, environmental damages, that's the same law firm that has now taken on Kasim Kurt et al. versus the Republic of Turkey. The Republic of Turkey was just in DC court arguing that these um, Individuals have no standing in court against the Republic of Turkey, but the judge dismissed the Republic of Turkey's request and, sa and said the, the case can go forward. Good sign. It may take a decade before this is resolved, however. I don't want people to get too excited, but I think this is a sign of dedication if I've ever seen it, right? So a couple of other things. Um, here, I wanted to just reflect a little bit on what's going on with what are, what are the options here in the United States, Canada, and Latin America. And here, I specifically rely on Mexico, Chile, and Ecuador. Why? Because they're already mobilized societies. They're deeply interested in Rojava and women's rights and feminism. They have their own indigenous communities that are mobilized, and they have had solidarity events. So that's the reason why I sort of go Americas. Um, we need to see an intensification of public education about what the Kurdish demands are because people are confused. Which Kurds? Are they all the same? Are they different? I shouldn't mention these stupid things I've heard from, sorry, I shouldn't use this language when I'm going public, but the language used by some politicians and their ignorance when it comes to issues. Um, of interest, of course, are, you know, I am assuming we see an HDP ban uh, in the next month or so. The securitization language, the femicide, these are themes on which the general public needs to be educated. We need to see more networking by uh, reaching out to sympathetic media out outlets. Also, I think academic circles are not connected enough. Public intellectuals are not connected enough. On the East Coast, yes. But what about other places? We can't just have the Eastern board be active and the rest of the United States, there's no, no contribution. When it shows up in the Boston Globe, it has to show up in the LA, LA Times and so on. Uh, so the coalition building that the European Kurd, Kurdish communities have pursued has to happen in the United States. We don't see that yet. Then I would say intersectional projects are so important. Students at universities are super interested in film festivals, in storytelling narratives that are talking about international environmentalisms, uh, feminisms, ideologies, systemic racism. There's so much there. We can't just rely, uh, rely on Columbia University and Brown University to carry the torch or Toronto University, right? This, this, or University of Toronto. These are like incredibly difficult things to do, but the branching out has to happen. In Europe, I must say, while much more advanced, um, it might be part of COVID, it might be part of um, complacency or lack of opportunity, but I am beginning to think that Kurdish um, issues are not as present as they once were. Why? Because maybe party politics are not as interesting to um, highly educated, young, you know, university educated, uh, young European Kurds. And this also seems to be less, less noticeable in the European Parliament. Mm, I, I would, if I would, you know, if I had a chance to think about it, I, I, I believe that's an area where, where the Kurdish community could do better. Also, I don't find the push against what's happening. The, the Turkish securitization language is deeply frustrating. And, and I think all of us here and in Europe need to push back harder, double down. I mean, the language that's coming out is 
repulsive, offensive, it's misinformation, it's propaganda, and it stands. And it cannot, because that's how people sometimes get informed. On another issue is that I think there has to be more systematic collaboration between um, supranational level activism and what's going on in various locations. So ethnic Kurdish agendas need to rise to the board of Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch. Uh, there are, there's occasional coverage, but not constant. So that is an area where I would also say we have room for improvement. So, um, okay, What's, what do people care about? Or what does the United States care about? What, does the, what do the Europeans care about? I, I listed some of the key features. Now we all know here in the United States that the Biden administration is more friendly than the Trump administration. I say more friendly towards Kurdish interests because none of the interests that Kurdish communities have will be accepted by the Biden administration either. The Biden administration has larger issues that it wants to address. It is uh, a potential temporary ally, but I wouldn't rely on the Biden administration doing, mu doing much it, other than trying to rearrange the puzzle in the Middle East a little bit. You know, some of the pieces might move, might be adjusted a bit, and, you know, that might be an entry point for Kurdish communities, but I, I wouldn't put my money on the Biden administration as solving any problems. So NATO, a key issue for the United States, of course, the, the, the you know, the, the Turkey's purchase of the S-400 missile defense system, that, that is something that really, really made people upset here in the United States, both among Republicans and Democrats. So they're going to push on Turkey to resolve that. Um, the Iran nuclear deal, Biden wants to have a win on that. Um, and then once in a while, I begin to see some notification about Kurdish rights, you know, it worries about Turkey's human rights offenses. So there is that beginning to show. What can be done about it? Here are some ideas. For the, for the lobby, move from Washington DC and build relationships with the diaspora. Move the lobby to uh, you know, have offices in Nashville, Tennessee, where you have the largest Kurdistan origin diaspora in the country. Syracuse, New York has some. Moorhead, Minnesota, come on, branch out, work, work your diaspora communities and then you obviously know Anthony Blinken and other staffers, you know, Anthony Blinken as the Secretary of State, he has, you know, he has experience, he has a position on Kurdish issues, time to remember that. On another agenda, of course, you know, this is an interesting one. I've suggested that myself personally in the KR, KR, to the KRG, but it didn't go very far uh, years ago already. But we in the United States, have a very, there, there are strong, influential, highly political Christian communities, different from Europe. Europeans are in that, you know, into that. But here in the United States, we have some serious Christian communities that are flying out to Israel all the time for pilgrimages and whatever they do. You can do something like that for Kurdistan in terms of, you know, I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, you have to manage it, but these people will care about what happens to Kurdistan proper if you also let them worry about what happens to the Chaldean and the Assyrian community. So why not weave that in? in? I think it's a major loss not to do that. And now you have the Pope visit. I mean, you know, this is like your springboard. Anyways, and then American education, a central issue, American public education on what's happening. In the European context, I think the issue is more, you know, it's right NATO, but also refugees. Um, interest in stabilizing the KRI is because of refugees. And I think the angle here is, can we move outside of Berlin or London and have some other cities also establish some presence so that uh, economic or educational partnerships can be built? So these are some of my thoughts on 
um, where we are. And um, I'm super interested in uh, getting your thoughts, your comments on uh, what your, 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 some of your questions perhaps and what you think uh, could be done, should be done, uh, what the opportunities look like, because I certainly am wide open to hearing, learning from all of you or, or getting some pushback if you think I, I missed out on something entirely. Thank you so much, Vera, for this uh, really engaging uh, presentation. Uh, so you have uh, one question. I'll start with those and then I have my own questions. Uh, okay. Um, I'll just do back and forth. Uh, so this is from Amy Howard. Uh, I think it's very important for grassroots activists to work within and between Kurdish diaspora communities to build a united Kurdish lobby. Uh, she says the issues and interests uh, may vary, but Kurdish influence is only diluted by each group lobbying for their interests individually. It also creates unnecessary confusion, like Vera said, which Kurds? Uh, so this is um, mostly like a comment. If you want to say something about this, I think uh, she is just corroborating. Uh, yes, and I, I agree 100%. Uh, if we, in fact, get to a point where at least activists speak to each other, I, I'm not going to suggest that the uh, Kurdistan lobby will give up its power and influence to talk with, you know, to sh share its agenda with, with activists. I don't think that's what they want to do because it's, uh, it's a clearly, uh, it's driven by a, a larger political agenda by particularly powerful individuals. But um, I think those conversations between um, various Kurdish communities are not happening very effectively. So I find it interesting when I go and talk to um, members of the Kurdish community in Syracuse, New York, which is just a couple of hours away from here and they're you know, of, of Iraqi origin, they have not spoken to anyone who is from another part of Kurdistan, right? There, there's no connectedness. Uh, with the general grassroots, you know, on the general, general grassroots environment. It is hard work. It takes years, right, to establish connections. And of course, you have to work from the center of power out. So where are the big universities? Where do most Kurds live? You know, that's how that begins. But it has to be systematically addressed to really um, establish a stronger network. So talking, speaking, dialoguing, um, um, is super important um, in intra-regional conferences. You know, you know Amy, um, I think you're right. You're mentioning uh, that conferences are great, but here's the problem with conferences. I've heard it myself. Diaspora communities feel excluded if there are academic conferences because they're like, what is all this talk? We live, we have our lived experiences here in the United States. We live far away. These people never include us. We don't have, you know, now on Zoom, maybe it's a little easier, but the complaints were, we don't have money to come to Washington DC for a march. We don't, you know, nobody's paying us for the bus trip or the day of away from work. So they're frustrated. Don't just lay it on the academics, build a network, you know? Yep, so exactly. So like uh, <laughs> Amy and I have this sort of back and forth. Yes, the think, think post COVID, think about picnics, think about sharing ideas, do a number of them, do community activism. That's what it takes in the region, branch out. I mean, that's what everybody did 20 years ago in the European context. I mean, listen, I, I, you know, how many pic picnics have I intended in, attended in Germany? I, I went to, uh, you know, I grew up in, in Dusseldorf and uh, Duisburg, if you are familiar with those areas, right? How many picnics have I attended to meet people, right? Year after year, events, marches, picnics, that's what it takes. Thank you, Vera. So while we're waiting for other questions, I have one question for you. 
Um, I don't know the answer either, so I would really like to hear your thoughts. So, um, I mean, when you worked on uh, Kurdish activism in Germany, I think I, I, I worked on the same topic a few years later, and I, I found my findings were really parallel to, to, to yours. But uh, now people are using social media more actively, and uh, we see a lot of activism. There's Twitter curves, etc. So uh, they managed to raise this awareness. So now people know at least uh, Kurds exist, which is great. Uh, but uh, how how do we know that uh, this activism is actually channeled towards uh, changing everyday lives of people who are actually living in Kurdistan? So how much of this activism is slacktivism and how much of it is actually creating real impact in people's everyday lives? How do we control this while we are talking about lobbying or activism? And I, I think that's the whole issue of how to scale up. Because in essence, um, Sending a message out on Twitter does not do anything positive necessarily for the Kurdish community in Turkey. As a matter of fact, if you are socially connected on, um, yeah, on, so, uh, on social media with that person, you might actually be detained, interrogated, or whatever, right? So, I mean, the we all have stories like this, but a few years ago, I suddenly appeared on a list as an academic terrorist in Turkey. I have never even heard of that categorization. And I was like, what is that? You know, and that's because I had uh, some kind of, uh, you know, social media exchange. Social media are being surveilled by the Turkish intelligence forces and not so much academic conferences, interestingly enough. We can publish all kinds of things. The assumption is um that um we are not to be taken seriously as academics right they don't take us seriously what they take seriously is um interconnectedness through social media what we have to make sure is speak to each other and upscale that rather than just sending a message out there and that is slacktivism right you're like wow cool i'll center myself as somebody who's an activist, I'm gonna send this message out and I'm really gonna show them how much they suck. Sorry, bad, bad language. But you know, that doesn't do much for the people on the ground, right? So yeah. there's so many issues we have to think about. Is it helpful? Does it advance the agenda? I mean, we have to have conversation of what kind of communication and what kind of outreach actually helps and what kind of activism can hurt. And that's why we need to have uh, connections to people inside a variety of countries to find out what is happening. These things change. Uh, <laughs> we need General Muslim to be here. Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, so uh, also I find, let me just make a gendered argument here. I find that so often um, male voices are heard, male voices are heard, are elevated and women's voices are left out, ignored, not taken seriously, belittled. I mean, there's a whole other agenda to that as well. So I think we need to reflect more carefully how and when we use social media, when we use, you know, when we, when we have a full campaign. Full campaigns often work. You have hundreds of people involved and you pursue a clear goal and you have a, a product and outcome at the end. But sort of ran, random Twitter, you know, good luck. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, <laughs> for reflecting on that. In the meantime, we received a lot of questions. So oh. I have one from uh, Heva uh, Kedir, and uh, he is also the um, author of one of the best books I've read uh, recently about the, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, so he says, uh, one challenge with lobbying in Western democracies is the regular change of administrations. Uh, you spend years to establish networks. It may all go away when a new administration uh, coming. So how can we address this inherent problem in lobbying? And uh, he says, thank huh. you. And that is exactly where it's at. So here is the trick to that. People like to make money. Politicians in particular, they never go away. They never go away. <laughs> they go, that's why I was talking about the revolving door. They are staffers, high staffers. They stay around for years. They're policy experts. 
they move in and out of politics. Even when they supposedly are retired from their political office, they suddenly reappear as consultants for communication firms. Mm -hmm. If you keep track of people and net, you know, and, and come up with a, like a, have you ever heard of asset mapping? You know, you mark down the assets that you have and the people that have done certain things. Asset mapping has not been used effectively by the Kurdish community, at least here in the United States. And it's super important. You gotta keep track of these people. You gotta have like your, you know, your spreadsheets. I mean, it's a pain, but you know, these people stick around, they don't disappear. They just take new jobs, they have a new angle, they're waiting for their return into the to political office. I mean, I have to say few people disappear from the American scene here. They always wait for a time to you know, return. It's actually uh, kind of a problem in this country, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Vera. I see some people are raising their hands. Uh, we are using the chat box for questions. If you could uh, type your question in, I will pose it to Vera in a minute. Uh, so now we have a question from Azat uh, Divani. Uh, ex excuse me for my pronunciation if it's uh, too bad. Uh, so he, he's thanking you for this important event. And then he's asking, uh, do you think there would be a possibility in the future that the Biden administration to invite representatives of Rojava and SDF representatives like General Muslim Kobani to Washington? Or everything would be left to the COVID matters or the Erdogan lobby against uh, such a possibility? So, you know, it's, it's always hard to look into the future. We have just a little bit of an indication that the Biden administration is slightly more interested in human rights issues. Um, interesting is the following. The Biden administration has not had an official phone call with Erdogan, right? That's unusual, that's unusual. You, you know, that, that means there's a bit of a pushback um when the turkish military uh ha, you know recently uh you know had its incursion into you know gare mountain, mountain region and uh the violence took place there the biden administration critiqued it there was critique articulated then of course uh, blinken pulled it back a little bit and you know yeah when erdogan complained but they still haven't really discussed it and the general comment is we don't know enough what went on the ground went on on the ground the turkish government has lots of explaining to do that is unusual right so i see opportunity there um, it sends a slight signal that there may be an opportunity to open up um, that there is, you know, clearly Biden articulated very strongly that with the Trump administration's withdrawal of American troops from that part from Rojava was uh, horrific. It was a crime, right? He said that before the election. So now let's push on that. What exactly, what, not just talk, implementation, right? Talk is cheap, talk is easy. What's the implementation? Push, 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 push. That's what's going to have to happen, right? There's actually this interesting group, which you might know, uh, here in New, in New York and France, <laughs> Justice for Kurds. Have you heard of them? Justice for Kurds. That's the uh, group that a lot of people find super suspicious because, you know, clearly they are. There are some, some people are in, in that group. You know, when, when we mentioned philanthropists, those are super wealthy people like uh, uh, Henri Bernard Lévy the French philosopher and uh, Kaplan, uh, what was this? Uh, Thomas Kaplan, the uh, billionaire, right? Thomas Dila was helping me out with Thomas Kaplan. So, um, and who else is on the board pushing back? Oh, look at that. General, retired General Petraeus, ring a bell? So there's a military guy, so they're military interests. Then you have former Florida governor, Jeb Bush. Oh, the Bush family's in, entangled. Then you had a retired, rather center-right uh, independent senator, um, uh, Joe Lieberman, right? So when you think of who is pushing behind that, these are highly established people with particular economic, military, 
national security interests. Do they also care about human rights? Mm, maybe, yeah, 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 I think they possibly do. But is that the first thing? Mm. I don't know. So they're interesting formations of these very wealthy people that push and try to take on an agenda. I'm a great believer in democracies where people themselves have a right to express themselves and not the super wealthy and pushing the agenda forward. And there are other examples. I just wanted to mention this particular one. I'm not opposed to allies, but let's be real what kind of allies we might have. Thank you so much, Vera. This, this is really powerful. So I have two more questions, but I'll take uh, Amy's forward because I think it's related. And then I, I have another question from Tai Wu Kang. So uh, Amy says, along uh, Azad's line of questioning, is there an official process by which Rojava leadership could request a meeting with Biden? So, uh, official process. That's very, very, very difficult. You have to find someone who is respected by the Biden administration who might be the go between. And I would recommend looking at uh, somebody who is maybe an academic or a person in media who has had a long standing relationship with a particular community and who also can be introduced to the right political person. Like, you know, who has connections to Anthony Blinken and staff? That's the angle, right? It's not the Pentagon. It might be somebody on the congressional or, you know, on a congressional um, committee for national, you know, national security related issues. Um, you could try through, um, through a uh, human rights organization. There are multiple angles you could take, but you have to be introduced to the right people. Um, Here's the thing, the main interest the Biden administration has is pushing back on Turkey and the NATO issue, getting the Iran deal in place, um, making sure there isn't, you know, you're pushing back against the Saudis, um, you know, resolving the Yemeni issue repositioning the Palestinian Israeli situation. There are a lot of questions out there. How easy will it be for Rojava to come back on the agenda? You're gonna to have to have some very serious long-term advocacy on that. And you're gonna to have to poke around and find out if anybody's willing to listen because the other agenda items are higher up for, you know, uh, are higher up for uh, for the American um, administration, I must say. So I don't want to depress you, but I think I want to be realistic. You know, I want to be realistic because I don't think Rojava is high on their agenda because it creates too many problems, you know? Thank you, Vera. Now I'll <laughs> lift our spirits a little bit by this question. <laughs> So it's from Tai Wu Kang. Uh, so it's a uh, lobbying efforts and activism by a group can be examined not in a vacuum, but in competition with other groups. And I think this is a great question because I was going to ask the same. Can you tell us a bit about these other groups whose efforts might be slowing down the Kurdish uh, progress? Well, I think what's slowing down Kurdish progress is lack of communication and hostility to a broader ideological agenda. So if you're super committed to one ideology and one outcome and you are opposed to pragmatism, uh, you're not gonna make a lot of progress. The American public and the American government is always center, center, center right almost, you know, in the European context or in the left progressive context, you almost think like, that's the best we can do in America. That's what you call a left liberal progressive agenda. It's shocking, right? 
but America is super conservative in general. So without some sense of pragmatism, they're gonna, the lobbies are gonna play one group against another. This, the comments I hear from politicians high, high up, because I said, I mean, I'm in Albany, New York, which is the capital of New York state. It's not New York city, right? For those that are abroad. Um, stuff that I hear from politicians that supposedly have paid attention, they're like, is that a group? Is that, is that one of the good Kurds or one of the bad Kurds? I'm like, where are we in the 1980s? I mean, it's disturbing. So the more ideological infighting you have, the less you can agree on some basic common shared ideas and values, the less pragmatism is included, you will not make progress in the United States. It is not a super leftist progressive environment here. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> Thank you, Vera. You have, uh, we have three more questions, so I'll keep pausing them until you say stop, that's enough. <laughs> so we have one question from Vesida. Uh, he says, uh, many thanks, Vera, for your talk. Uh, my question is related to how much the Turkish state lobby undermines the appearance and efforts of the Kurdish lobby. It's terrible that, I mean, so you, the question was, sorry, I didn't hear the Turkish state lobby? Uh, yes, um, I'll, I'll read it again. My question is related to how much the Turkish state lobby undermines the appearance and oh. effort of the Kurdish lobby. The Turkish lobby undermines a lot of messages. They're quite connected. They have been working on their, um, on their agenda for a long time. They spend a ton of money. I just looked it up for you. Um, they spend, um, well, they spent a million and a half just last year. Um, the, the Kurdistan lobby spent 240,000 on one lobby group, the B, BGR group. Um, the interesting thing is, well, in my view, in my view, the lobby firms that have worked with the Turkish government are some of the least desirable lobby groups because they take on what I consider slimy customers. And there are, you know, one of the groups, Greenberg Traurig, also worked with Hulk Bank. You know that there's a case going on with Hulk Bank um, and investigations. Um, I highly recommend, for example, that the Kurdistan lobby not hire the same lobby firm as the Turkish uh, state, which happens on occasion. I'm not sure what the plan is there. I don't think they're going to spend enough to out lobby the money that the Turkish government spends. So they spend three to four times as much money, the Turkish government in the United States, as the as any Kurdish lobby group, except for maybe private, super wealthy individuals. But then again, they pursue their own positions. Um, what is missing also is that in the Kurdish activism scene, we do not have contacts to newspapers or media outlets the same way that the Turkish state has established. It's a problem. They feed propaganda all the time, and you do this long enough. Um, particular journalists are, you know, suddenly weaving in ideas from that they've been heard, that they've heard about before, or they have easy access, and suddenly you're thinking, where is this all coming from? But it's a plan. It's a network. It's a system. They also spend some money. Sometimes, you know, I must say, several Middle Eastern lobbies um, have paid journalists to, to write op-ed pieces. So watch out on the op-ed pieces on occasion. Yeah, so I think it's a big, big problem how, the, how strong the Turkish lobby is, but also, you know, there are some Iranian opposition groups, there are, you know, there's a Kurdistan lobby, there are individual economic interests, I mean, you know, it's all not networked and not connected, and it, it makes all efforts vulnerable to spending by the Turkish state. Thank you so much, Vera. Um, so we have another question from uh, Anne-Sophie Schott. 
sorry for my mispronunciation, <laughs> and Sophie. Uh, she actually has a, a, a very fantastic book coming out about the Kurdish diaspora activism in Denmark. So I think this question matters. So she, she says again, thanks a lot for your interesting talk. I think this is what everybody agrees. Uh, you mentioned lawsuits, she says. Do you think courtroom activism could be used more in order to raise the attention on the uh, ban on Kurdish political parties, etc.? And uh, she's meaning to do co courtroom activism proactively. I think courtroom action is very important. Very important, um, especially in the United States. I know it could really make a difference because it's taken seriously that you as an individual have standing against a repressive government, right? Um, in Europe, you, I, you know, it, it's been disappointing in terms of the European Court of Justice, decision after decision, Turkey doesn't take it seriously or there's, an, but you know, any systematic push Anything that gets you into mass media, into discussions, you have legal panels, a lot of lawyers work with nonprofits in terms of international human rights organizations. That is decisions like that are read all the time and really matter. So even if the outcome doesn't seem to be bringing a strong shift, the fact alone that it's discussed in among legal experts and their exchanges about opinions and com comparing those to what's happened with maybe um, communities in you know, the Rohingya, what happens with Palestinians, what happens with, uh, you know, currently in Eritrea with the Tigray region. Very, very important. This is how you get people entangled, connected, interested, and they make a commitment to a particular cause. So Anne Sophie, I, I think it's a great question and I think I would consider it important. Thank you so much, Vera. They want to go on, there are two more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they keep coming. <laughs> and I, I kept my uh, toughest question uh, at the end. Ah, okay. Um, uh, so uh, Bano Wahab says there can be many activists and lobbyists, but how realistic is intervention when we have government like, uh, governments like the UK government and many more who favor relations with the Turkish government rather than the Kurdish people? So who can continue to lobby the, uh, the governments, but how is it useful if the sanctions aren't implemented in the long term? Yeah, so, you know, that's what I'm saying in terms of the long, long term investment. We cannot and should not be devastated. Well, we are devastated by the lack of interest and the lack of commitment. We are dev devastated on a human level, on a personal level, it is deeply shocking and insulting. We are not in a period where we, will, where we can expect intervention. It just simply will not happen. Europe is very econo-nationalistic, <laughs> you know? They're interested in, you know, in in uh, in coming out of this uh, pandemic. Uh, they're interested in reimagining the economy. They're interested in strengthening their own domestic employment sector and other issues, as important as they might be to us, are not on the priority list. What they want is don't send us any more refugees. What they want is don't cause any more, you know, uh, civil unrest that then inspires members of our communities here in Europe to, to start, you know, protesting. Um, so right now it's a grim atmosphere. But again, we have to position ourselves for, for better days and better days will be coming. I believe that just alone, the fact that the Biden administration is redirecting means that there is a chance that the Biden administration and some of the European governments will collaborate and then push back more than what we have seen before. So let's not be devastated. Let's, let's focus on what the repositioning might be and let's encourage that repositioning uh, to, to happen to take place and be more concrete. But for that, we need media people, we need 
human rights activists, we need lawyers, we need faculty members, we need conferences, we need video productions, we need documentaries, we need university students, we need anybody, anybody at all who's willing to participate, right? Thank you, Vera. Okay, we keep going. More questions <laughs> coming. <laughs> So Said Keskin says, uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, you are witnessing Turkey trying to put pressure on all three states of the Middle East to make Kurds and Kurdistan national rights to self-determination out of the table. So Afrin, Serikani, uh, Gurespi, occupied in Rojava. In Bashur, it has already made more than 40 military bases and pushing Iraqi government to change uh, uh, constitutional status of the KRG and regarding to the Kurdish question allied with Iran. Uh, what is your thought and suggestion to all Kurds? So, um, I think what we see inside of Turkey is instability. The reason why the incursions are happening is because the Turkish government is facing a serious struggle economically, socially. I think we have to look at domestic factors. In my reading of what's going on, and you all could tell me I'm way off because I'm, I haven't been in Turkey for a while, but life isn't that comfortable anymore. There are a lot of problems socioeconomically. And at some point, um, Turkish voters will take note of that again. At some point, they will also realize that um, the parties in place may not actually represent all of their interests. Propaganda and nationalism works for a while, but there are again ups and downs. And so I think we have to wait for more. I mean, we, we, we need solidarity from Turkish citizens, uh, the Turkish diaspora in Europe. Um, um, without it, it might be difficult. And I, and I think uh, the, the Turkish state um, will try and crush, absolutely crush uh, political organizing among, among the, the Kurdish communities. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And um, there are no, no, there's not one answer to that. It is pay, being vigilant, responding and building new kinds of networks. And that happens all the time. What they dismantle, we need to build back up. Thank you, Vera. <laughs> so uh, we have a question from Taban Yasin. Uh, so regarding Iraqi Kurdistan, um, they had Mam Jalal, he says he was a powerful speaker and he was very good at lobbying. So uh, now that uh, he passed away, uh, he doesn't think there's an alternative now. now. So who do you think uh, can replace uh, Mam Jalal? <sighs> <laughs> I mean, see, this is the problem with having these um, powerful families. This is the problem with having insider politics, right? We have to open up, we have to think, we have to really take, um, take a look at who's talented, who's good at it, who are the great advocates. And I think we're crushing younger spirited, voices in many of the places. Earlier, I think, I don't know when that was, if I said that privately or publicly, I think women, women need to have to play more of a role. I think younger members of Kurdish communities that are highly educated need to play, um, you know, uh, need to play a bigger role. Um, it needs to be people who are willing and able to not just position themselves at the center of, a, of power. If you're interested in enhancing your own position, I think that you are not the person. You are not the person to represent broader Kurdish interests. And I, I fear there, there are a lot of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them that are very much trained into this old style sort of, you know, patriarchal, strong family ethnic bond kind of arrangement. And I, I, I must say, I don't endorse that. 
thank you, Vera. You 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 even like opened up more questions now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I don't know if it's good or bad. Whole idea behind it. Uh, so we have a question from Mujda Amin. Uh, so she says your talk actually highlighted the need uh, for Kurds to become united, but also uh, rather than competing, uh, it, it should be about building alliances. So she's asking whether there's opportunity to build alliances with uh, other communities in Jordan, Bahrain, Morocco. She put Amazi community in parentheses. So they are ge geographically close and have potential, she says. So what do you think of this? Is, is it possible? So Yes, I think there's so many opportunities, but um, there also is a lot of, there has been a lot of caution because British communities are very, very nervous about being co-opted or their voices being drowned out by a more powerful group. I mean, in essence, you know, I think it's time to think about who can be an ally, right? It's dangerous to have certain allies, but you know, I think it's worth at least to learn from how the Jewish lobby works in this country, just FYI, right? Uh, not that they always succeed, they have tremendous failures, but at certain times they have, you know, a strategic plan. Um, there are particular communities that are doing pretty well. But it's very easy in the United States to actually find some local allies. Mm. Greek Americans, uh, Jewish Americans, um, Armenian Americans. There are lots and lots of people that are organized. And I actually found it very interesting in interviews I've done a few years ago um, that a lot of young like, I mean, young Kurdish activists, 18, 19, 20, maybe to 25, have such connections. But when they are speaking to the elders in their Kurdish community, who tend to be male, the word is no. No, that's not how we're gonna work. That's not how we're gonna make progress. Uh, we have to respect what we have done in the past. We are in a unique situation. And there's a sort of a generational dynamic at play too. But I think in the next few years, five years or so, we will see a change. I think those young people are coming. They're university educated and they are tired of the sort of narrow politics that are being played. So I think there are great opportunities in terms of networking. Um, so yes, so <laughs> yeah, I'm reading interesting comments once in a while and I can only agree. So, <laughs> but you know, um, it's, it's truly, um, we have to be more systematic in terms of finding our, you know, our ethnic minority allies, our Western allies, don't center them, don't center them. But they are, they, they also have struggled mightily and have made some successes and have failed in some ways, but why not learn? We can learn so many tricks of the game from others, right? Why do we have to suffer through the same failures? Just because, you know, we advocate for the Kurdish case? I don't think so. Let's, let's network, let's think through what works, what doesn't work and reposition. Thank you, Vera. This is very, this is very useful information. So I, I, I'm just asking um, if you have more questions, please put them in the chat box. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> you know, make Vera more tired, but I think this is really interesting and I am really happy that people are engaging. So I'll just ask my question then, Vera, my, my second and last question, and then perhaps we'll receive others. If not, we, we just wrap up. Um, so I was just going to ask, you know, um, so we mostly talked about uh, practical matters now, you know, the, the, the issues on the ground uh, mm -hmm. and the policy level, but I'm just going to ask an abstract question now. So, yeah. um, you know, we talk about a couple of different actors here. So it's the it's the ho home states or the governments uh, or, the, or the minority groups, whatever 
whatever you name it. And now we have the diaspora and we know that they are fragmented. So when it comes to lobbying, we are uh, we're assuming that there's only one goal. So it's the recognition of Kurdish uh, basic human rights and beyond. But on the ground, actually, the, the, the agendas are really uh, complex and sometimes they're in competition. Plus, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even, even if they are um, on the same page, the actors are different. So who, uh, the, the, the simple question is who sets the agenda for lobbying? Who decides and who prioritizes the issues that should be on the lobbying agenda. And uh, I mean, does the diaspora ha um, have its own agency? Should it should the prioritization come from uh, the homeland? Uh, and uh, also, this this brings another question um, to my mind. So sometimes the governments do not actually represent what the local people want. So we saw, <laughs> it, for example, when it comes to the uh, government initiated memory politics, which really did not find uh, local support in Halabja, etc. So, uh, so how do we find the, the, the agenda in this really complex situation? It's not just mm. for the Kurds, but for other diaspora groups as well. Yes. Um, so I would say that's why I'm often much more comfortable with transnational um, organizing and advocacy work than I am with official lobbying. The mm -hmm. only official lobby we have in this country and, you know, in Europe in essence, well, we used to have HDP lobbying, but HDP is about to be dismantled. So they don't really have a voice anymore. And everybody knows it's coming. So they're not part of the conversation. So the only other group in town is the KRG. They have a very narrow agenda and it is always focused on security questions, military aid and fossil fuels. So if that's not your interest, then that's not the lobby for you. So uh, there is no other lobby in this country, at least there's no other lobby. So it falls on activists to organize and find access points. Um, what you have to have is an organized advocacy structure where you know who is doing a really good job brainstorming ideas and translating that in meetings with politicians. And that means state level politicians who then bring it up in Congress or bring it up to particular offices. For example, you may have heard of um, Representative Omar in Democrat, hard left Democrat from Minnesota, right? Somali American. Now she is hard left, but she has no idea about the Kurds. She actually made some horrendous statements about, uh, you know, supporting uh, the right of uh, the Turkish government to defend themselves against terrorism. And we about lost our minds here in the United States, trying to lobby her, get in contact. So there are particular people that need to be educated on these issues. You can't just state something like that without having the background knowledge. She got really careful after that, right? But um, there are particular politicians that have to be addressed and connected with and lobbied. And then we have to go to DC and, and continue that effort. And that is advocates who have to do it. Now, how do you make sure you don't represent your own ideas? Well, I think it's often totally different what the diaspora wants than what the community in the home region wants. Not always, but like in the KRG, for example. I don't think the lobby in DC represents what Kurdish communities in general represent because there's no such thing as in general. You mentioned Halabja. I mean, you know, there's no representation for anybody from, from, you know, that part of Kurdistan in Washington. There is none. So um, this is a huge problem. So the only way to address it is systematic meetings to discuss what the agendas are, by whom, how, and then hash out what you can agree on. But no, the KRG lobby does not speak for the interests of the people, all people in, the, in Kurdistan, Iraq. The, the diaspora does not speak for all community members, you know, um, 
in the United States. And somebody, I forget now, I saw a comment flick by, you know, poor Roger Lunt, always forgot, always forgotten. Yes, always forgotten. There's no lobby here at all talking about, I mean, I was so angry last, was a couple of weeks ago when, um, I don't know if anybody saw this, uh, Farid Zakaria GPS, it's a fairly well-known show. He had uh, Iranian officials on, on there. He didn't ask a single question. He asked all kinds of questions to, to this Iranian, to the Iranian leadership, not a word about the situation of Kurds. So immediately a flood of complaints, you know, went there about, you know, what is this? Why do you, why do you not include it, right? Pushing, re-educating. But in other, in other words, um, that is something that has to be hashed out by community members. And as long as it's very loosely organized, this is incredibly difficult. And that's why uh, Kurdish lobbying and Kurdish advocacy is so vulnerable to opposition forces, because we do not have a structure in place that allows a variety of perspectives to be heard, articulated, and then acted upon. Thank you so much, Vera. <laughs> That's a whole article, a book about these things. Well, I don't know. I don't really feel like it. I think these, <laughs> these discuss as well. Yeah. So we have uh, one question from Elif Gench. Uh, oh, Elif, yeah. Uh, she also says, Vera, thank you so much for such an interesting talk. That's uh, valuable strategically as well as informative. Uh, you may uh, be well aware of an ongoing court case against the Turkish government after being beaten up in DC by uh, Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Do you yeah. think uh, this has the potential to set a precedent against uh, Turkey being held accountable for uh, abuse of Kurdish people and activists outside of Turkey? Uh, yes, I do. I think uh, I mentioned earlier the case Kasim Kurd et al. versus the Republic of Turkey. It's a most important case. Um, and I think if it is decided in favor of uh, the, you know, um, the, the Kurdish victims of this horrible attack by the bodyguards and by Erdogan's goons, it will set a standard for I mean, globally, it will set a standard. I think this is why at first the Turkish government didn't respond at all. Then they try to have the case dismissed. They are concerned. However, this is a long-term prospect. These kinds of cases are not decided quickly. And the main thing is to keep it going and get it in the media and talk about it over and over again, what this government did. They came to the United States and they treated, and not only did they come to the United States, I want to point out before they came here and did it here, they did it in Chile and they did it in Ecuador and they beat up students there and the same guys that came here and did it here. They beat up students in Ecuador and they attacked, I think, a Chilean um, advocate in parliament. So there are multiple governments paying close attention to how this court case will fare. And I think it's one of the most hopeful. Uh, yeah. So average court case seven years. I said ten years. I think my my guess, you know. So in about a decade or so, we'll know if this will lead to a different to difference. I I sure hope that the government will be held accountable. That it will go down in all case books because then it will be published in case books just like um, the prior cases against environmental pollution by fossil fuel co companies, you know, in other countries like Ecuador and Nigeria and so on. These are big cases. They get a lot of attention and we can build on that. So I think Elif, great question, really good case. I'm really hoping for the best for it. Thank you so much, Vera. I think we covered all the, all the questions. <laughs> uh, okay, just one from Amy. Uh, uh, does the uh, Syrian Democratic Council uh, um, uh, get involved in uh, lobbying in uh, Washington, D.C.? So, um, you know, uh, so my thing is uh, lobbying means you hire lobby firms, right? Is that what you want to do? You want to hire lobby firms to speak on your behalf? Hmm. I think you want to find allies here that want to speak on your behalf. I think allies as in human rights 
experts, lawyers um, that are interested in Kurdish human rights. I think to have people like that or university take on a particular project, I, I, I think that might be better than hiring and outsourcing, outsourcing a firm. Um, so uh, yeah, okay, me? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a job. I, I, I'm already doing too many other things on the side. Yes. So I'm resigning sure. from official lobbying contracts. Thank you, though. But um, <laughs> I've, advice, yes, I can, I can give advice. Yes, I'm happy to do so, but I'm not in the business of lobbying. But it bothers me to no end when, um, when we don't get media coverage that's accurate and when we don't get TV coverage or you know, when the activism only happens online and only uh, particular people look at it and it doesn't go beyond that. So, um, so uh, you know, I don't know. I, I hope I'm optimistic despite the fact that I said it's a difficult time. I am optimistic. I see opportunities emerging and I think post COVID we will see more organizing again. And uh, another shout out to Toronto. I think great work and, and, and Elif brings it to New York. <laughs> and so in Washington DC and other friends. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's great to see um, so much dedication. And it is often, may I highlight, young people, university students, and also a lot of women. So um, there's you know, a nice connectedness around that. Thank you so much, Vera. So I'm taking the last question now. Um, <laughs> okay. Last one, so they keep coming, but many people uh, are just uh, conveying their thanks to you, by the way. So Dylan and uh, yes. uh, Said Kiske and others, they're thanking you for this great talk. Uh, Resul also. So uh, the last question is then, uh, do you perceive the possibility of any successful campaign against the heinous crimes of ethnic cleansing and uh, the crimes against women, religious groups in Afrin perpetrated by the Turkish forces and Turkish commanded jihadist groups? So um, I think there's a chance, but there is broad lack of knowledge in the United States. Um, people don't understand who attacked whom. And I don't think they understand that the Turkish military has subcontracting mercenary operations there. And then people get confused when they hear, hear Kurds and Turkmen and Yazidis and they're like, oh, what? I mean, it happens to me all the time. I need to explain so much that we never get to the point. So that's why it's so important to connect with people that are serious about it and put effort into it, time and, and ideas and creativity. And so in that sense, I think um, that's where one of the major downfalls is. We need to um, systematically address these issues. And once we have that basis down, people will be outraged. I mean, people are outraged when they get to see my students at university are outraged when I tell them and show them images and I tell them what happened. They're like, why don't we know about that? Why isn't that in the media? I'm like, well, you guys aren't paying attention, but you know, that's another story that I repeat on a regular basis. But um, you have connections to university faculty that then integrated in their teaching and they can bring up a whole new crop of activists. You don't feed university professors or particular programs with ideas or issues or information, you don't have that pipeline. So that's why it's so important. But yes, I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, sorry, I got a funny message, but you know, in essence, it's super uh, important that we really think through those kinds of agendas um, um, and you know, and I think I just gained a whole bunch of new friends in new ways. <laughs> yes, you did. Based, based, from, based from the messages, uh, I'll, I'll get some, some and, connections. Uh, somebody asked for your um, contact, so I, I put your uh, university web page there. So if, you, if anybody. Great, yes. To, so, yeah. so you can find me. I have, um, you know, I learned, I learned I can't put a lot of stuff on Facebook we have, because of friends that are sometimes in vulnerable positions and you can't really, you know, I, I don't want to cause problems for friends. So, um, 
but you know I am paying close attention. So if you want to be in touch, uh, send me an email. Um, my last name is so weird and unique. You can find me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can just uh, confirm that she is always very helpful. And uh, you know, sometimes as uh, early career researchers, you reach a professor and you never hear from them. Vera is not like that. She's no. I do respond. I do respond. I I have like you know. Yeah, that's why that's why sometimes I feel like I don't get enough rest, but that's a different story. That's my <laughs> that's my problem. <laughs> that's your service uh, to to humanity. No. So, uh, uh, Vera, thank you so much uh, for this fantastic presentation. I think everybody learned a lot, and uh, although I've been working on this issue for a long time, I've also learned a lot from your presentation, as always. And uh, you showed us that uh, lobbying and activism might overlap, but they're they are two different things. And uh, you showed us that country context matter when it comes to uh, success and effectiveness of lobbying efforts. So uh, I have also witnessed that sometimes 10,000 signatures wouldn't bring the success that, uh, for example, Ibrahim Do did only by himself. Uh, so it is really uh, a complex issue. Uh, we talked a lot about the US. Uh, I hope that they invite you again. So this time we, we spend more uh, time on the European context as well and talk about different attitudes of different countries uh, in the EU. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. So the floor is yours again, if you want to say uh, final words, uh, just to wrap up and then. Well, I'm, I'm just super excited that so many people tuned in. I mean, I wasn't really expecting that, but uh, because I thought, you know, most people see the word lobbying and they glaze over, but apparently that's not the case. Uh, so I'm, 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 I feel privileged. I feel honored uh, by the questions and by the suggestions and by your patience. And I have to thank Bahar in particular because she is such a, a, a good, person to collaborate with and she is kind and thoughtful and she is a really good friend and as are many others on this call. So I, um, I wish you all the very best. It was a great, it was great to see so many of you and I, I feel encouraged by your interest and um, many of you have probably much better ideas than I do about what to do next because you're connected to particular communities. And um, I think you should feel strong about what you do and go forward with it. Discuss it, pursue it, think about it, communicate. Um, this is a very important area that is often under theorized, I think, lobbying. And um, many, many, many faculty are interested in researching lobbying and activism especially since we now see a lot of intersectional work and there are indigenous communities interested. We have solidarity movements and young people are calling out for ideas that they can sink their teeth into to make a better world after these horrific Trump years. So um, I think I think we're in a good place to jump off of. So I want to leave with a positive message. <laughs> thank you so much, Vera. So thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you. I will invite you again, Vera. So we will see you again uh, in okay. the <laughs> platform. So thank you, thank you everyone. Take good care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.